it is. It's lovely. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. You can hear me OK? It's all good? Um, I just want to start by saying thank you very much for inviting me to speak for you. And I'm really genuinely excited to be here. Um, the best kind of talks are ones that you give to people who you feel are your colleagues or your brethren. So um, I'm excited to be here. And I love Perth. It's my second home. So um, thank you for that. And um, that was a lovely introduction. I um, stole what I was going to say about myself, but it's OK. Um, so um, as Ben rightly mentioned, I think a lot of this week will have been focused on providing good care for patients. And um, I think that's a really important element of our career. Um, but I think sometimes our own health and our own well-being is overlooked. Um, and I'd probably rephrase that. And instead of saying sometimes, I'd probably say um, almost all of the time. So in the short time we've got today, I want to take what's a little bit of a heavy or a serious subject, but maybe present it in a slightly playful way, but with some pearls that you'll take away and maybe keep with you. Um, I give this talk a lot to GPs or hospital doctors. And I feel in some ways I'm grateful for the opportunity, but they are already on an established trajectory. They are already in that place. So to be able to um, make an impact when people are still formulating their identities as doctors, I think is really exciting. And you're all in that position. Like, you know, when you move to a new school or to a new city, you can kind of redefine yourself. And you'll find when you do your rotations, you're in a similar situation. Each time you change, every four to six months, you can think, what did I like about how I worked in the last rotation that I want to keep? And what did I find I want to improve or change? So I'm hoping there'll be some things from this talk that you gleam that you'll carry with you through your career. All right? So um, my short talk is on staying well in medicine. Um, I'll only race through this, but yeah, my name is Ahmed Kazmi. I'm a GP, and I'm also currently retraining um, to become a dermatologist. Um, I spend half of my life in the UK and half in Australia, and I just dodge the immigration service of each country in turn. Um, <laughs> For my post mills, I did have a pathological addiction to exams. It was my way, it was one of my coping strategies. Um, but now I found a new, a new outlet, and I've taken up stand-up comedy and cabaret, which you might get a small taste of um, during, the, during the conference. And um, as Ben also mentioned, I'm really passionate about provider well-being, and I think we all need to look after ourselves better. Charity starts in the home. Um, you can Twitter me, and that's my website. All right? So. If I'm correct, you're all medical students, is that right? So, yeah, anyone a junior doctor yet, or? Nope, they're all on the wards. And is anyone studying anything other than medicine? No, nope. lovely, okay. And are you like a baseball team over here, the people with the? <laughs> so is it? Yeah, where, where are you from? Griff Tafe. <laughs> Griff Tafe. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, love that team. Um, I saw some prisoners earlier too, and you look a bit like a volleyball team. With the burgundy jumpers, where, where are you from? <laughs> You're welcome. And I even heard some people traveled as far as New Zealand to be at this conference. So statistically, there's only two, so they're probably not in the room. But if you are, are you? You are very welcome. Oh, well done. Can we have a round of applause for the person who came all the way from New Zealand? So in the short time we've got today, I want to do th three things. Okay, I'd like to explore some of the causes of work-related stress, burnout, and suicide, particularly relevant to the medical career, to the medical profession. I'd like to, this is the most of the talks going to be on ways of reducing these, or negating these, or factoring them in, and then just a little bit of advice on work-life balance. And You'll read, there's lots of guidelines. You know, people, as doctors, we want, um, you know, a randomized control trial or a double-blind placebo study. None of those exist for doctor well-being, OK? There, no one has done that. So a lot of this is just my personal anecdotes or experience, but I've tried to make it mirror or be in line with what of, um, evidence is out there or what guidelines are out there from reasonable sources. So like Royal Colleges or the AMA, if you Google any of them, they'll have some. And that's what I've tried to mirror, except anyone can read those. So again, I've, I've tried to pick the ones that I think people don't always want to put on paper or ones that are a bit more to do with my experience rather than something you can, can read. So I'm not going to tell you to do exercise and keep hydrated, which is also really important, but you can get from anywhere. Okay. And this is a little bit about the context, about why it's important. So these are all headlines from last year, but everyone will remember them. So put up your hand if you've heard of Chloe Abbott. Okay, so she was a, a medical student, a, a junior doctor who committed suicide. And unfortunately, she's not the only one. And I think 2017's count in Australia alone was something like 15 to 20. That's suicides in doctors. And I find that baffling. 
I find that sad, I find that disheartening, and I think if this were happening in any other profession, that there would be a much greater response to, to match it, but I think it's so stigmatized within our own community, we can't even talk, amongst it amongst, we can't even talk about it amongst ourselves. So that's why I give this talk a lot, because I think part of this process is about destigmatizing and, and talking about it. So this was the, the background of why, why, I, why I'm interested in this. And I'm gonna, I know it's really difficult in a big room like this to shout out, but I, I was here in the last talk and I, I can appreciate you are quite a rowdy, enthusiastic group, so I'm hoping you'll do it. But um, I just wanna ask you to think, can you think of any specific reasons? Just shout out why you think doctors might be particularly at risk of burnout, stress, or suicide because of their job. Yeah, so the young man said self-expectation, so I agree. The, um, the kind of... Um, uh, outcomes that they would expect of themselves often are unrealistic, very high, or not the same as not the same that they would expect from somebody else. So I think that's a, a really fair comment. Anything else? Seeing people in pain. Exactly. The, la the young lady said, "Seeing people in pain." So most people, many people, have a service provider job. They might work at a checkout stall in a supermarket. They might work as a hairdresser, and um, you know, people often like to offload their problems, don't they? But like you said, it's different. They don't offload their problems like their bowels are hanging out you know, in the hairdresser. Or they don't offload their problems like you have to tell them they have cancer or that their relative just died. So I agree, There's the nature of the work by default is high intensity, it's high emotion. Anything else? Yeah, so it is quite a hierarchical profession. It's quite nice if you're at the top on the upper echelons. It's not so nice when you're at the bottom. And that's actually reflected when you look at the suicide rates and the, in that. So I agree with that. It's like a kind of... Um, a social, there's really strict rules about social engagement that we don't really now find in other aspects of our life, but suddenly we're having to really strictly adhere to when we're in the workplace. Exactly, yeah, so physically it's quite a taxing job. People have to work shifts, they work nights, then they switch to days, they have long days, they often are not in sync with their partner or their friends. So you already have a lot of insight into the problems, and I'm just going to recap a couple of them for you. So, with your expectations comment, I'm going to slightly, I think the opposite side of that coin is perfectionist. And most doctors are your type one personality type. Everything's got to be right. They used to win prizes at school. They play a few instruments. They wish to carry that through their whole life. And then you turn up in a district general hospital and suddenly it is very hard to be perfect. All right? Um, does, any, does anyone know what external referencing is? So this is a term that refers to when, whether you're good or bad, depends on how people perceive you. And most doctors are quite externally referenced. We've done a good job when we know that we got a good grade, or somebody told us that we good, did a good job, or we won a prize, or we got a round of applause. Um, and how many times do your patients give you a round of applause? Doesn't happen too often, does it? So if, you're, if, you're, if, you're in, if you have a personality type where you require that, unfortunately, medicine often doesn't give it to you, especially when you may have been accustomed to it growing up. We discuss this high pressure job, high emotional intensity, often thankless. Like with any, it's almost service provision. With most service provision jobs, people, the, the ratio of making a complaint to saying thanks is usually like this. And it's the same with medicine, you'll find, unfortunately. You'll do 10 really good jobs, you'll make one mistake, and it will be the one mistake that ends up on your manager's desk. All right? um, it can often be very isolating if you work in a rural community, if you're a general practitioner, or sometimes even in a hospital, although it's full of people, you might not actually have meaningful engagement with any of those other people. You're just doing your own thing and you happen to be occupying the same space. And you might go for a whole shift and you haven't had an actual conversation that is unrelated to a patient with somebody. And this is my favorite, different times. So uh, my brother-in-law, he's much older than me, he's also a doctor. And um, I was, when I was a junior doctor, I was complaining to him once because I had had to do three consecutive 12-hour shifts, all right? And he was like, this is nothing in my time, you know. We would work 92 hours on call, straight, no sleep. He's from Pakistan, by the way, if you were wondering. <laughs> and um, I kind of agree with them, and I kind of don't, and I'll tell you why. So, you know that older generation, or my brother-in-law, when they did a 92-hour on call, I don't think anybody was Googling, and no one was coming to them with cutouts from the newspaper. No one was scrutinizing their notes. No one was asking them to constantly justify their decision-making process. Does that make sense? So although our shifts may be physically shorter now, I actually think the package in which providing healthcare comes now is so much higher stress and more 
um, bound in litigation that you can't compare the two things. One is an apple and one is an, one is an orange. And also, you know, the nature of the consultation with the patient has changed vastly. So if you study consultation models over time, you know, we went from having a really paternalistic one where what doctor said went, doctor knows best, you don't question the doctor, to then we've come, now most recently we talk about patient-centered care. We're facilitating the patient, how, how is the illness affecting their life, their experience. But in real life for most doctors, unfortunately, what does that translate to? It translates to a kind of transactional model, like a consumerist model, where they tell you what they want and you have to give it, and if you don't give it, you, you know that you're going to come into difficulty or be sued or be in trouble. And that, to work under those circumstances is stressful. One of the things that people respect most about job is autonomy. And if you feel the very way in which you practice because of the hierarchy of your bosses or the consumerist nature of the interaction with the patients is no longer allowing you autonomy, you can see why that can feel really trapped, a trapped place to be. Um, and then like I mentioned right at the beginning, so whenever a patient has a symptom, it can be anything, abdominal pain, head pain, deep down, what are they worried about? Cancer. Whatever is wrong with them, they think they've got cancer. And if a doctor is unwell, and they have a, a problem with depression, anxiety, substance misuse, anything, what's the one reason they're fearing seeking help? They all think they're gonna be taken off the register. Okay, they all think that they're not gonna be able to practice. And just in the same way, and this is one of the like, take home messages, if you don't listen to anything else in my talk, what I'd say is, with your patients, okay, most of the time it's not gonna be cancer, and with doctors, most of the time you're not gonna be taken off the register. All right, so even if you just leave with that message, that that end, that, that worst case scenario actually for most people is not the real, real scenario, the real outcome of seeking help. So now, five tips for medics on improving well-being, and I put according to Dr. Ahmed, so I'm not representing the AMA or the RACGP because some of the, the tips are a little bit, <laughs> um, it's just my opinion, okay? So the first, my first tip for you guys is, Look after yourself first. I think people great, grossly misunderstand what patient-centered care means. And when, they, when we say the patient comes first, that doesn't mean the doctor or nurse comes second. And if you understand that right at the beginning, I think you'll do really well, all right? Um, so who, I know it's a bit difficult because you're medical students, but I usually ask in the room, uh, if I've got doctors or nurses, who has deferred a, a toilet break because they've been too busy at work? And everyone will put up their hand. Ah, okay, Did, are some of you already on placement? Like, do you also, okay. So put up your hand if you've ever deferred, if you've omitted urinating because you were too busy. Okay, now keep your hand up, put your hands up. Keep your hand up if you would give that advice to a patient. So why don't we take our own advice? Who has ever, because of work commitments, deferred seeing the doctor for something, or missed a hospital appointment, or not booked it because they just they felt they, they, they weren't allowed to take the time off work? Again, would you ever recommend that to a patient? So I think we need to arrive at the place where we understand that we are not subject to a different standard that we hold our patients to. We are subject, our health is as valid and as important, and we don't obey, but we don't have different anatomy or different physiology to our patients. And therefore, if our patients need feeding and watering and toilet breaks and have a right to a certain number of hours, and we do too. And if everyone moves forward with that same thought process, I think you'll do well. But again, because I think older doctors didn't have that, there's this kind of inherited feeling that we should therefore also go without it. But if it's going to translate to burnout or leaving the profession or being unhappy or committing suicide, I don't think that's a reasonable thing to keep as the status quo, all right? Um, so don't feel guilty about putting your own needs first. This doesn't mean putting the patient second, and well doctors make well patients. If you are fed and watered and hydrated and rested, that is good for your patient. Therefore, be in that place when you come, come to treat them. And always ask yourself, take the advice, what would I say to a patient? You know, like, um, so when you're a junior doctor, this is gonna happen to you. It's gonna be two in the morning and you're gonna be called to somebody with breathlessness. And then you're gonna re read the notes and you're gonna speak to the nurse. And then, and then a little voice is gonna say to you, should I do an arterial blood gas? And then you'll spend five minutes fighting with yourself because the machine will be in the other part of the building and then half of the time it doesn't work and then by the time you've got there, it's plotted. But deep down, you know you should and that's why you ask the question. So it's the same with your own health. You will, you will have an internal barometer that says, I really need to pee. Listen to that voice. 
okay? That voice is speaking the truth. Don't suppress the voice, okay? That's my, my advice to you about putting yourself first. And why do I have a picture of Mother Teresa? She was lovely, but we don't need a Mother Teresa in the hospital, all right? That's how it works. You, you can be perfectly compassionate, loving, competent, professional doctors without having to pay the uh, price of admission of your own health or well-being. The two things, you can do the two things without having to pay for that. So yes, I did have my mammogram today. Why do you ask? All right. I thought it's Friday, it's in the morning. I'll... My next tip, don't expect anything from your patients. All right? So again, what often ends up happening is the patient, you'll prescribe them a course of antibiotics, they won't take it, or they'll only take one day and then they'll come back and then you'll feel let down, all right? Or um, they want some special test done, you don't even know what the test means, you have to Google it, you order the test, and then they don't come back for the results, all right? Or they've missed their hospital appointment, you go through great difficulty, you ring the hospital, the consultant secretary, you manage to get them a repeat appointment, and then they don't go for the appointment. And then a small piece of you will die inside, <laughs> all right? And now this is what you gotta do. You have to let that, let that not happen. Because actually, why do they have to do those things? These people are autonomous adults that have a right to self-governance. We are only there to facilitate. We say, okay, this is what I think is wrong. This is what you've highlighted to me that you need. This is how I think we reconcile the two. This is the management plan. I'd love to see you again in a fortnight to see how you've got on. And if they come back and if they haven't done a single thing of yours, that's not a failing of you and you don't need to own that. You don't need to be like, okay, I said it. Does that make sense? And I would, I would start grooming yourself, condition yourself to find that place now, okay? So don't expect them to attend hospital appointments. Don't expect them to be grateful when things improve either, all right? Because you would think that that's the logical response, but it's not. Um, and no expectations means you can't be disappointed, and that works for dating as well. <laughs> all right? This is what it looks like when radiologists take a selfie. My next tip, okay, is to accept imperfection. Does anyone know why I have a picture of, this is a, a type of Persian rug called a qum. Does anyone know why I have this picture here? Go on, you're nodding your head, so just shout out, be brave. Exactly, so the young man said, these Persian rugs are all made with a deliberate imperfection. And the reason behind that is, so in a lot of Islamic cultures and traditions, they believe the only being capable of making something perfect is Allah or God. And therefore, if you did that or if you aspire to do that, it's, it's heretical or disrespectful. So they'll make a beautiful rug and they'll put an, an obvious incorrect stitch in to, out of humility. And I find that sweet for two reasons. I find it sweet because the sentiment is nice that they're trying to say we recognize that we we don't want to create a perfect carpet. I also find it slightly delusional that they think they could make a totally perfect carpet, <laughs> even if they wanted anyways, but there you go. So, I said right at the beginning that doctors have perfectionist tendencies, and it's true. You want to be the first in the class, you want to get the best mark in the essay, you want to win the prize. Um, and then you, you try to apply that to medicine. And here's the thing. Being a perfect doctor is impossible. Being a perfect anything is impossible. Perfection by nature is, is, is hard. So what is achievable, though, is excellence. So I'm not saying you should lower your standards. I'm saying you should set a standard that is actually within your grasp of achieving. And so much of what you do is dictated by the systems in place around you, the support, the amount of money in the healthcare that are not within your power to control. So if you're expecting to be a perfect doctor and half of the stuff you can't even control anyways, you set yourself up for a... Uh, a mismatch that is always going to create a tension. So you're, what you, it sounds like semantics, but it's really important. I would extricate from your vocabulary the word perfect and say, I would love to do an excellent job. I would love to be an excellent intern. I would love to be an excellent. Does that make sense? And again, it allows you, it gives you leverage to actually sometimes fall short or be normal or make mistakes. Whereas if your end point is always perfection, you will struggle. Um, I got that from Oprah Winfrey, by the way. Uh, and not about doctors, but she said excellence isn't, uh, perfection isn't achievable, but excellence is. Um, the other thing that I said that was different to our generation than our predecessors is that medical knowledge is no longer secret or confidential. Everyone has it, and anyone can access it at any time. We don't have a monopoly on our own profession anymore. 
And the other thing is that it's changing really fast. It's a bit now like the, the Industrial Revolution, the way suddenly the world went overnight change. It's a bit like that with medicine. Like, I've, not been a, I've been a doctor maybe a de 10 years now, a decade, but when I look at the drugs that I studied in medical school versus what I'm prescribing now, half of them we didn't even have. We didn't have biologics. I had like two medicines for diabetes, and now I have 10 to choose from. So when you're working in that field with one that is changing so rapidly, again, if your aim is perfection and to know everything all the time, you create a sense of perpetual anxiety that you are never going to be able to negate. So what I would say is, I want to know about all the important stuff now. I want to be aware that at regular intervals, I need to update my knowledge. So I will go on an update course once a year, or I'll read journals, or I'll do an online. And, but if a patient comes to you and they know something that you don't know, or a new drug has come out recently that they've heard of and you don't, that's OK. And it doesn't make you a bad doctor. Does that make sense? And again, I would hold on to that, all right? Um, when you, so, and I've put all of these in moderation, so I learned that the hard way too. So from my exams, you have, to, you have to set a limit because you have a home life, you have a work life, you have obligations, and if we just, medicine is one of those things where they catch us really early. It's a bit like being a stormtrooper in um, Star Wars. You're kind of groomed. You don't really know another way of thinking, you don't know another way of being, and sometimes therefore its importance can bleed into other areas where other people in a different profession wouldn't have that bled into their personal life so much. So again, be mindful. Say, am I, am I doing this? Is medicine becoming, you know, affecting my weekends, my days, my evenings? So does anyone know what this picture represents? Any Catholics, any Shia in the house? Go and say it. So on a bacteria, what's the little thing called at the end that looks like a tail? Thank you. Did you like that leap to help? So it's called a flagella, which means whip. So this is self-flagellation, which was a form of penance practiced in uh, medieval times for if you'd sinned. A lot of people still do it. Um, so the reason I put this picture here is when you make a mistake again, because because of the way we're all set, our first reaction is to self-flagellate. I am so terrible. I shouldn't be a doctor. I'm not good enough. And I, I used to do that too. All right. So. Um, I'm going to share a story with you now uh, of when I was a junior doctor, and it, with, it will sound terrible at the beginning, but bear with me. So once, what's it called here? I can't remember when. It's your second year of being a doctor, so you're not a house officer. In England, it's called SHO. What do you call it? RMO. RMO. Okay, so I was an RMO. I was in the emergency department. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't laugh. But I sent home a lady with bilateral humeral head fractures. Okay? I didn't just send home a lady with one broken arm, broken shoulder. I sent a lady home with two broken arms. Okay? And now you're all like, I'm not taking this man's advice. But <laughs> what if I told you that she had no bruising or swelling, she had full, bo full range of movement, I couldn't localize tenderness to any, any part of her body, she had no neurological deficit, she had no vascular deficit, I spoke to a senior at the registrar about the case, and then we sent her home. Would that change how you feel about my mistake? It didn't change how I felt about it, though. So I had done everything correctly. My documentation, documentation was impeccable. I'd spoken to the senior. I, had, I didn't get into trouble for it, but I felt terrible. I felt like I didn't deserve to be a doctor. I had caused this person harm. I had, and now in retrospect, I think that actually, this is what I mean. Sometimes this happens. We have, we have a system to avoid this, but sometimes it happens, and then what do you do? You learn from it. So what, what were my learning experiences? That actually, the injury that she had come in with, despite all of my clinical findings, my index of suspicion for an injury should have been so high that she probably should have had loads of imaging anyway. So that was one thing I learned. I also learned that if you're postmenopausal, lower your threshold significantly for x-ray. So um, the way in which that was handled, though, by my senior didn't leave me feeling terribly pa empowered or useful. I, that had been a negative experience, and it stayed negative for many years. And any mistake is, will upset you. But what I would say is try to find in it, allow yourself to grieve or lick your wounds for a day or two, and then think, actually, what positive thing can I take forward and move on from this, rather than just whip myself, all right? And um, I won't tell you about the other two, because I think I've probably said enough. Uh, I was going to talk to them. And now, I said it's five, but it's actually seven, because seven didn't sound like a good number, so I called it five. Um, <laughs> Never make a decision that causes you to lose sleep. So when I was a, um, a registrar, it was my final year as a GP trainee, and um, it was Friday evening, and I was on call, and my trainer was at home, because that's where your trainer is when you're on call. And um, I saw a young man with abdominal pain, and he was well, and I couldn't quite work out. I thought this could be appendicitis, or it could not, but he's quite well, so I could send him home with safety netting advice, or I could send him into ED. 
and I couldn't decide between the two options. So I rang my trainer who was at home, and I was like, hi, Dr. So-and-so, I've got this situation. And he listened to my story, and then he said, yeah, could be appendicitis, could not be. You could send him into hospital, or you could send him home. I was like, okay, I had arrived at that point myself. Um, <laughs> I was hoping you would tell me what to do or what's the correct thing to do here. And he said to me then, he said, do whatever is going to mean that you can sleep at night. And I have to say, I thought he was being facetious. I thought he was being a little bit rude. Um, I didn't find that terribly useful advice. And then years later, I reflected on what that actually meant. And what it means that is a lot of the time, medicine is black and white, and a lot of the time, it's gray. And there are many outcomes for correctly, professionally, defensively managing a situation. And if you're ever faced with that situation where there's lots of choices that you could do, they all have the patient's best interests at heart. They are all defensible and sensible. Pick the one that is going to cause you the least distress. If you send somebody home and you know that you're just going to keep thinking about it at the weekend, and one of your other alternatives is send them in, send them in. Again, do, do yourself that kindness and that favor that sometimes this is a balance between the patient's needs and yours. All right? And then I've said, no people sleep better. And what I mean by that is everyone will have a colleague who you haven't asked the question yet, and you already know the answer is what? No. Can you do this? Can I do that? Can we? No. And no people generally tend to sleep much better than yes people, OK? Because it will be the extra patient at the end of the day where you've just seen 25 extra already that will be the one that you're stuck with for three hours. It will be the one prescription you say yes to that you shouldn't, you felt like you wanted to please the patient that will then have a drug reaction and then they'll cause it. Does that make sense? So again, just remember, you shouldn't be saying, you know, if somebody needs CPR, that's not a time to say no. Um, but sometimes it's legitimate to exercise your right to say, and when you get really good at it, you say no without saying no. So you say, oh, I can see this is really important to you. I'd really like to help you with this. Let's book you in again so we can give this the time it deserves. I'm not seeing that right now, but I didn't say no, so that's what I do. Treasure the good moments. Oh, I'm in two minutes of overtime. Was it, did that, you know the clock in the corner, does that include question time or not? Okay, so are we doing a bit okay? Fine, I'm almost done. So treasure the good moments, and I mean this. So all the other ones are like, don't do this, don't do this. This one is about what I want you to do, and it sounds so daggy. I learned that word in Australia. It's in my <laughs> little pot of Amer uh, uh, Australian words. I tried perpetuating in England, but no one took it. Um, Anyways, I tried Oka as well. That one didn't float in England either. Um, so, sometimes in your career, people will be thankful, and they will be grateful, and they will exteriorize this, and they will let you know, all right? Treasure those moments. Don't run off to the next patient in the queue and be like, oh, thank you, that's so kind. You know, again, I think we're, we're, we're a bit Mother Teresa, and we're like, oh, you don't need to thank me. No, no you can thank me. It's OK. <laughs> all right? It will do you good. And don't just reflect on it. And don't just remember it, and don't just, you know that gentleman was talking about how he, numbers have pictures. So everyone, when I close my eyes, I have this bank, like of the episode with the shoulders. I have a bank of when things went wrong. You will all have one of those banks. You also need to create a bank of when things went really well and you did really good. There's something called mood congruent memory, and when you're really sad, all of those sad ones will come flooding back, and you will struggle. Unless you have habitually remembered or talked about the good times, you will struggle to remember the good ones, and you won't make a, an objective balance of what your profession is actually like when you're really stressed up or upset. So I would get in the habit of doing that now. And another way you can do this is with ta tangible things, like keeping cards, keeping gifts, and put them in an album. And these days, because of revalidation and appraisal, often you're actually asked to evidence that people like you. Um, and I'm just going to race through this to finish off. So work-life balance, again, means lots of things to lots of people. But basically, these are my top quick things. Almost everyone comes into medicine with some kind of interests that aren't medical, like volleyball or baseball. <laughs> keep them and try to keep them going with your career. Family life is really important. And with the same diligence you would attend a shift or you would honor a commitment you made to a work colleague or to a patient, that's the same degree of diligence that you need to exercise with your responsibilities to your family. Um, humans are highly social creatures, but we all need alone time, and that will get harder and harder to get. The more senior you get, you get more and more juniors. The older you get, you usually do have a partner, you have children, but don't forget sometimes everyone needs a day where they just play Candy Crush, all right? <laughs> physical activity, like I said, and some people, the only time they can switch off from work is when they're physically out of the country and in a different time zone. If that's you, take more holidays, all right? And yeah.
I still can't work out if this one is real or not. But uh, anybody in radiologist can tell me. So at the beginning I said I hope that we would talk a little bit about the reasons why doctors are particularly susceptible to work-related stress, burnout, suicide. So do we feel like we've achieved that? I said I'd hope you'd, we'd explore some ways of reducing it. Do you feel like you got that? And we talk a little bit about work-life balance. So keep in touch with me. Let me know if you want some career advice or life advice. You really have. I'm happy for you to contact me. And thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Let's jump over here. We're going to go into a time of Q and A now. Just um, sit on the couch. I think your ability to combine humour and wisdom is second to none. Yeah. Um, as can be seen right here. Yeah. Which one looks best? I like the other one, actually. Do you want to go back? Well, that's good as well. The other one was like this one. We have a roaming cube. Um, do we have any members of the academic team here in the audience? Could we have someone, or anybody from UWA? Could I single out someone here to jump up and just run that cube out to a few people? I think I'm the only person here from the academic team, so apologies about that. I don't know what's happening. What's happening? We're about to be throwing a cube out to people for questions. Pardon? <laughs> I, do you understand what he's saying? Am I oh. speaking too quickly? Sorry. I hear you. What? Sorry, Dr. Ahmed. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to try and regain control of this situation you by do. asking you the first question, Dr. Do Ahmed. That. My first question to you is yes. that, um, that's more of a statement, I loved, I loved your talk, I, I agreed with most things um, that you said, but there was one thing that I couldn't quite understand. He only agrees with most things, guys. There was one thing that I couldn't quite understand, and that was your pathological addiction to exams. Uh, okay. Could you explain that a little bit more to us? Yeah, so um, we describe coping strategies often as being adaptive or maladaptive, and that's whether they cause you harm or they don't. So some people, if they're stressed or they're in inner turmoil, they'll do yoga, they'll talk to their friends, they'll see a therapist. Some will cut, self-cut, drink alcohol, do drugs, make sense. Um, and I found in periods of my life when I was really very upset or um, uh, in periods of distress, my way of managing that was to do a diploma or a certificate because it meant then I had to read books, I had to sit down, I had to be regimented, I had to, and it robbed me of those evenings where I would sit and be able to ruminate. Um, and so I'm not sure on that spectrum of adaptive to maladaptive where you would put that, because in some ways there was a positive outcome to it, it was useful, but actually again, it was a way actually n neither of being mindful of what was happening or of it was about trying to suppress it or negate it or change it. So. That's what I refer to as my pathological addiction to exams. But um, I, I, now if I'm stressed or worried, I've got a whole other, I call it, when I'm talking to patients, I refer to it as a backpack. And you take out things to deal with situations. So before, I didn't have many things in my backpack to deal with stress or life events. I would, I would pull out gynecology diploma, pediatric diploma, and now I can pull out other things. That sounded a bit more sexual than it was <laughs> supposed to. But I do do that sometimes too. It's also good for stress. But too much and it's pathological. It does make a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> we're going to go into questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question? It's a bit of a hard talk to have questions to, I think. It's but. true. It's true. Any, any questions pertaining to anything for, for Dr. Ahmed? Yeah. Oh. Do you, do you get a stand-up routine? So you might, actually. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say any more. You said nothing by saying that. Yes. You uh, can make me talk. We have Frank just over here. Hey, Frank. Uh, when you were a junior doctor and a medical student, how did you find that your humour was received by superiors in the workplace? Sorry, just that when I was a junior doctor. When you were sort of a junior doctor and a medical student, how did you find that your humour was received in the workplace by your superiors and above you in the hierarchy? Ah, OK. How was my humour received by my seniors? So when I was a junior, uh, I wasn't humorous. And I think that was. <laughs> That was part of the problem. Somebody talked about hierarchy, and one of the rules of hierarchy is that they're very strict rules of engagement. Like in court, if there's, as in a royal court, people, you know, in some cultures you don't turn your back on the king, you have to bow when you talk, and medicine is still a little bit like that. So actually, I never really, I was serious all the time, I was, and I was one of those doctors, I didn't want to make any mistakes. I, I had such bad, this is this being recorded or not? I'll tell you anyways, who cares? I had such, as a junior doctor, I had such bad irritable bowel syndrome, I had to have a colonoscopy to make sure I didn't have colitis. 
that's how stressed I was, of like wanting to make sure everything was okay and I didn't kill anybody. So there wasn't actually any humor, and I think that was one of the problems. And I think in retrospect, if I, I'm not saying you should joke and laugh with your consultants necessarily, or it's all to do with context though, and I was actively suppressing who I was and my normal behavior because I felt like that's what the situation dictated. And we do that to an extent. You behave differently when you're with your parents than you are with your friends, than you are at work. But um, it shouldn't feel so much like you're actually having to, you know, substitute out who you are. And now, um, I think part of it is because, as a GP, um, you're quite autonomous. But now I can really use humor as much or as little as I like, and I love it, and it makes my day joyous. And so I can't tell you how they received it, because it wasn't there. Um, but now I've gone back to hospital training for my dermatology, and um, sometimes it crumps up, and it's is well received. So I think uh, deep down, um, everyone, everyone does like a little bit of fresh air. Anything else? Great question. I've got one up over here. Can we get the mic over there super quick? Just throw it, Frank. Yeah, to Frank. That's a great okay. throw. Thank, thank, oh Ooh. shit. Ooh. <laughs> we'll edit that bit out. Um, thank you for your comments. I found you uh, discussion of self-flagellation, quite an interesting one. After watching successive generations of, you know, my friends move up through the medical workforce, there seems to be this permeating idea that if you're not falling apart and if you're not sitting right on that edge that you should feel guilty, that you should feel you're not giving enough to the profession. You know, do you have any more comments on this and how can we as a profession really address that and overcome that? So I. Did everyone hear what the young man said? So I 1,000% agree with you, and I think it's to do with two things. So there's this concept of the wounded healer, like with Mother Teresa. Our job, our occupation is bound with this notion that we're a, a service-giving, um, service-providing, helping group of people, and therefore, in order to do that, we're best to do that from a point of pain ourselves. If we're not coming to some harm or some suffering from, like just in the same way a nun will renounce clothing, uh, not clothing, you know what I mean, posh, she won't wear Versace, she won't wear, like we have to renounce things. We, in order to be really respected as a doctor, we have to put our family second. We have to, and I think this is nonsense. I think it's total nonsense, and I think we need to ditch that, yeah? And the other thing is people, like the general public, um, often are quite intolerant of doctors if they are seen as doing very well. So if you do have, they don't, they like it when, you, when you're suffering, but if you have a really nice house and a really nice car and you finish at five, it, it, it's not, you're, they're like, oh, well, you can't be that good a doctor, can you? Because if you were a good doctor, you would be on the edge and you would be overstressed and you would be, and I think that's gonna take a long time to change, but that's what we need to work towards. No one would want an on the edge, on the verge of breaking policeman with a gun. No one would want an on the edge, on the verge, crying, upset fireman. So actually, we need to make sure that we say, no, trust me, if I leave at five, I will be a much better doctor for you when I see you all the other days of the week. Well, actually, the fact that I have a nice house is okay because I trained for 11 years and I'm allowed to buy one. Like, so I, I, I do think <laughs> that we, and also it's because all those things that we um, doctors don't allow themselves, toilet breaks, seeing the doctor, going, et cetera, we are resentful of our colleagues if they break this unspoken rule and they do it for themselves. And you know this is true. So deep down, if you have a colleague that takes half a day off because they have to go to their doctor's appointment, everyone's like, because they know they're like, I wouldn't have done that. Well, maybe you should. And maybe you shouldn't be resentful of your colleague that does. And I think together, if we all ch slowly, gradually erode this, the norm will become we are all happy doctors and we give good care rather than we're all suffering or self-flagellating. That's what I think about that. <laughs> That's what happened. I said, Rashonda, you can't control your man. Nothing I can do. <laughs> don't self-flagellate. It was the response no, there. Do I self-flagellate? No, I don't. But so you know, just a little side quirk. You know how in Christianity, they're like the two biggest groups are Catholics and Protestants. So in Islam, the two biggest groups are Shias and Sunnis and it's about 90% Sunni and 10% Shia, so I'm the 10% because I love being a minority. <laughs> and um, every year they do this special religious ceremony where they process through the streets and they self-flagellate. Google it. It's actually a little bit sexy. <laughs> Anyways, but I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I'm just joking. Great insight, I think. I'll that's, just that's, brilliant. You. that's brilliant. <laughs> Do we have any more Anybody questions? Else? I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, is there another? 
Oh, in the corner. Oh, I'm not going to do as well as that. Oh, shit. I shouldn't have won. Oh, this there. is a good one. Let's see. Let's see. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Oh, oh. Shall we still clap? Because otherwise it's kind of rude. Yay. Oh, oh, and she's. There's a, there's a knee that's oh. been done there. Hello. Does hello. that work? Okay. Hello. Well, I just, you kind of, hello. You already um, kind of semi answered this question, but um, in terms of talking about like work life balance, and kind of ridiculous hours you're expected to work in overtime. Um, how do you think, as junior doctors, we're supposed to kind of navigate the risk of putting your, your life first and like damaging your own career and being seen as someone who isn't dedicated to the profession? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and the di it's a difficult one to answer, and I'll tell you why, because you're quite right. A lot of the rota, it's obligatory. You don't have a choice in it. But what I would say is, if you get into really good habits, where the time then when you're not, so when you're post nights, actually don't factor in loads of things. That should be the time that you rest. If you're pre nights, you rest. So if you get into really good habits and think that um, actually maybe for the short period of time while I have these antisocial hours, I need to rethink how I'm living my day to day life so that my well being, my physical and my mental health is optimized. And there are ways, therefore, then to negate that pressure without saying I'm not going to do nights. And also, everyone, we are, her, we are a heterogeneous group of people. The impact of shift work or night work or long hours is different for different people. And some people actually weather it much better than others. And what I would say is in your junior doctor years, if there is already a pattern establishing, like I found, that nights were seriously detrimental to my well-being, then I would say you need to balance your, your future decision about which avenue of medicine you go into. So one of the main reasons at that point I picked general practice was because I thought if I picked a hospital-based specialty, I probably wasn't going to get to the end of it because I just found the whole thing so tiring. So, so I picked general practice and I loved it. And I loved that I controlled whether I did weekends or not. I controlled. And now I'm at a different place in my career, a different place in my life. I feel much more robust. And I, I've gone back to hospital medicine. So um, I hope that answers your question in a bit in that I think it's twofold. One is in the short term, what are the measures I can do to minimize the negative impact? And also longer term, is this something that I think I'm going to be able to sustain? I think that's it, yeah? That's another good question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, I'm, I'm gobsmacked that you're able to be a dermatologist trainee as well as do all these incredible things um, and come and speak to us today. Um, we are so thankful oh, thank for you. everything. Can everybody join in, me? I did fly in, especially for you guys. Economy as well, just saying. Affluent <laughs> yeah, economy for y'all. Guilty, our budget is low. Apologies. Oh, oh that, wasn't a, <laughs> that wasn't a dig at them. I was grateful for the ticket, it's fine. But thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Cheers, Ahmed. Bye. Cheers, bye.